Welcome to the Word of the Lord, the weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Mark Clements, in-depth, relevant biblical teachings will help you in life and living in today's world. Now, let's join Pastor Clements in the service already in progress. Praise God. We're doing a series right now. Welcome those of you who are streaming. Glad you're glad you're with us. Some of you, uh, you don't even you're not even part of this country. You, you, you're, you're, you're outside of America. We have people stream from Asia, from Africa, from Canada, from north of our border, south of our border, uh, uh, and, and get comments from you. Thank you. Thank you for the emails. Thank you for the comments. Those of you who are streaming from other states, uh, you know we're in an election cycle, a, a national election cycle here uh, in America. Uh, but uh, wherever you're from, whether or not you are, that's not our topic for tonight. Take your Bible, turn with us. Uh, we're in the middle of a series called The Preacher Connection. The Preacher Connection. Uh, and and, and uh, I'm glad to be connected uh, to a number of preachers. Some are my colleagues and friends and brothers in the Lord and sisters in Christ. Uh, some of them have, have great influence and input uh, in, into my life. Some are gone on to heaven uh, and, and they have really strongly influenced, really creased my life. Uh, my pastor currently right now, uh, I'm, I'm blessed that he's still here and, and still helping me. He was here on Sunday, got to fellowship with him some on Saturday, a little bit, and some on Sunday, just a little bit before he had to, had to go. I, I very, very, very much enjoy, very much enjoy ha having a relationship with a living, loving, walking, talking human being uh, that's over me in the Lord that I can submit to, that I can submit decisions to and determinations to uh, and, and questions to, uh, and, and that I can just sit at his feet and, and then I can say, let me help you. How can I help you? What can I do? How can I serve you? What, 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 what do you need? Just, just, just anything I can do. Uh, and and uh, uh, to have to have knowledge that from what the Bible teaches, from what the Book of God has to say uh, about the the very important subject about being connected to one of God's messengers and representatives uh, and, and the people uh, uh, who He chooses and pulls out of the rest of the body of Christ and gives them a special uh, duty and responsibility and therefore an anointing to fulfill that. See, a lot of people think whom the Lord calls, He anoints. No, whom the Lord calls, He gives a responsibility to, and then He anoints them because without that anointing, they cannot fulfill that responsibility. It's not about the anointing. It's not about the gifting. It's not about the hand of God's on my life. It's about what's the responsibility He's given me. He's not anointed me to be the great apostle to the African continent because that's not the responsibility He's given me. He's not anointed me whatsoever to be an evangelist to the nations uh, and, and have tent crusades and have millions saved. He, and, and he won't anoint you to do anything other than what he's given you the responsibility to do. And, and, and uh, uh, we may get into delegation. We may get right into delegation before this series is over at all. But it's not our subject for tonight. Uh, tonight, well, let's look again at Luke chapter 4 and... This is our, our foundational verse. Jesus, in talking to the people, the very first time we have record of him going to the place of public assembly, the place of public worship. We'd call it going to church. Uh, he went to the place of public worship on the day set aside for that, the Sabbath day in their case, verse 16. And, and, he, and he stood up and took the book of Isaiah and, and, and he read something that was written about himself. Uh, Isaiah chapter, uh, uh, well, this is Luke chapter 4, and he's quoting from Isaiah, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he's anointed me to preach. This was written about Jesus, of course, in the Bible. There's a lot of things written about him in the Bible. There's some things written about you in the Bible. Aren't you glad that you're found in the Bible? Whether you're found by name or not, you're blood washed, and that's found in the Bible. You're the righteousness of God in Christ, and that's found in the Bible. By his stripes, you were healed. That's found in the Bible. You were. 
You were. My God supplies all of your need according to his riches and glory. That's found in the Bible. And there, so there, there are things that talk about you in the Bible. Uh, and, and one of those places that we find written about you in the Bible is Ephesians chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 4 talks about all of us doing works of ministry. Uh, and, and it says in verse 11 that he gave some to be apostles and some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers for the developing or the perfecting or the equipping or the discipling of God's people for works in the ministry or for the work of the ministry to edify the entire body of Christ until we all come to the unity of the faith and knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, fully mature, complete Christian adult under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about by every new doctrine, by the slight of men, cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So every member of the church, every member of the body of Christ, every member of the family of God, uh, everyone is listed somewhere in either verse 11 or 12. Verse 7 says to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So everyone is graced, everyone is gifted, everyone is anointed, everyone is called and chosen to work in the ministry. Our duties may differ. Uh, uh, our, our responsibilities may differ, therefore our titles may differ, but every one of us is, is, is found there. My job is different than yours in that, but we all have the same duty, and that's to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ and, and to fulfill his ministry and his mission of building the church. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what Jesus said. That's the only thing he said he would build. It's the only thing he's constructing, the only thing he's erecting. That's, that, that is his mission, and we're helping carry it on. Now, back in Luke 4, when, after he identifies himself as a preacher. Now, some people get upset with you when, when, when you identify yourself. Uh, I never have a problem. I like to know where, you know where people are at. You know, I like to go to other churches, and I like it when people come up and say, you know, my name is so-and-so, and I serve as the worship leader here. I serve as the music director. I serve as a, one of the ushering staff. You know, I serve, I'm a parking lot attendant. I, I'm, I'm part of the, uh, the, the television crew. Uh, I, I work in the nursery. I'm a, I'm a youth minister. I like to identify people. I like it when people can tell me where they serve. You know, when I go to a church and I shake somebody's hand, so, so where do you serve here? And they kind of look at you like, uh, well, uh, I, I come to church. Well, that's good, but where do, you, where do you serve? Jesus went to church, and the first thing he did was find in the Bible where he was identified, and he said it out loud. It's the first thing he did. First thing he did is said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach. That's the first verse he ever read. He read it out loud. He read it to everybody. He didn't make any apologies for it. He said, this is what I do in church. This is what I do. The Spirit of God is upon me because he's anointed me to preach. That's what he said. That's what's written about him. It was put in the Bible about him. I can find what's put in the Bible about me, and I don't have any problem saying it, neither should you. That's what the word confession means. We, we, we grew up in a time and came up in a time when people thought confession meant you, you could just confess anything you want. I confess that a billion dollars in gold bullion is going to be dumped in my front yard this morning, and it's going to come to pass if you believe it. Nonsense. Let me say it again. Nonsense. Okay? The word confession means to speak what God says, to repeat what God says, to say the same thing as God. That's what confession means. And so I need to find in the Bible what it says about me and then boldly speak it, just like Jesus did right there. And if it says he supplies all my needs, I can boldly say. If it says by his stripes, I, say, I can boldly say. If it, boldly, if it says as he is, so am I in this world, I don't have any trouble saying it. Uh, if it says I'm forgiven, I don't have any problem with it whatsoever. Uh, if it says I'm the pearl of great price or the field of great value, I don't have any problem saying that, and neither should you. Praise God. Amen. Amen. He said, the, Lord, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach. Identified himself right there as a preacher. He goes on and he has some conversation with them in verse 21 and in verse 23 and 24. And in 25, 26, and 27, he gives two examples of, of uh, uh, scriptures in uh, the book of 1 Kings and the book of 2 Kings. And there's two accounts. One is of a widow and one is of a person who had leprosy. 
One is of a widow woman, and her financial strait was that she was about ready to eat her very last meal and then die. She was going to starve to death with her son. That's not a good financial place to be. The other was a physical condition, and the physical condition, and, and there, by the way, there was no other answer. There was no state program. There was no federal relief program. There was no going to your neighbors. Your neighbors were already out of food, and they were eating their children. They were dying like flies, and, and there, there, was, there was no other answer. And the preacher came walking into the yard. God sent him. God prepared that whole situation, and Jesus referenced it right here. The preacher connection. She didn't get connected to a new place of employment. She didn't get connected with, with a particular government supply or, or program. She got connected with a, a person who was connected with God, one of his messengers, one of his servants, a man of God, a preacher, uh, a prophet. And, and the next example there is Naaman the Syrian, and, and he had leprosy. And, and that was in 2 Kings, and he did the same thing. There is no cure for leprosy, wasn't then, isn't now. The only thing you can do is force them off into a leper colony, stay away from each other, uh, social distancing, uh, and, and, and stay out of society so other people won't catch it and die there. And die there, a leper. But he got, he got connected to a preacher. And he's a leper no more. And he was, he was completely and totally healed. He didn't get connected to the preaching. And the Bible stresses that, so I've been stressing it. He didn't get connected to the teaching. He didn't get connected to a prophesy, a prophecy. He didn't get connected with a book or a CD set or something he found online. He got connected to the preacher. And because of the connection with the preacher, Elisha in one case and Elijah in the other case, both of those people's worlds were totally not upended, but, but uh, 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 placed to right. Uh, and, and, in, and, and in the widow's case, she ate during the whole famine. And in another case, uh, he was totally and completely healed. But before either of those statements, verse 24, before he referenced either of those scriptures from 2 Kings 5 and 1 Kings 17, he, 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 he makes this statement in verse 24. No prophet is accepted in his own country. No prophet is accepted in his own country. Again, he did not reference the prophecy. He didn't reference the preaching. He didn't reference the message. He didn't reference the, the, the teaching. He referenced the teacher. He referenced the preacher. He referenced the prophet. He referenced the messenger. And he said, no prophet is accepted. He didn't say the prophecy isn't, or the teaching isn't accepted, or, or the, the, the sermon isn't accepted. He said the prophet, the minister himself, is not accepted in his own country. That's what Jesus said. All right? If you look over a couple pages to the left in Mark chapter 6, Mark chapter 6 he says the same thing here. He says the same thing. Now, this, this is the same, uh, this is the same uh, reference uh, that we see over in Matthew 13, if you want to just write that reference down as well. Uh, Matthew 13, right toward the end of the chapter there, uh, in, in verses 54 through 58. But notice, if you would, verse 4, he said, A prophet is not without honor, or is not honored, except in his own country amongst his own kinfolk. The margin of my Bible says relatives. And in his own home, in his own house, amongst his own family. So he says here that a prophet is not honored in three places. Notice what they are. In his own country, that's where he's well known. That's where he's well known. Okay, you know you 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 know what a what what a uh, uh, a big shot is. You know who you know what a big shot is. A little shot away from home. That's what a big shot is, because at home everybody knows him. At home, everybody knows everything about them. They know their strengths, they know their weaknesses, they know their likes, they know their dislikes, none of which have anything to do with the anointing of God on their life. 
But in their own country, those are the things that people get focused on. Those are the people. Uh, uh, can you take it tonight? Yes. You sure? Yes. Okay, I'm going to preach to you because you said you could take it. All right. That, those are the things people get hung up on. Those are the things people get hung up on, and it robs them of receiving. It robs them of receiving, just like it did Jesus. Don't tell me that there's any human being that's going to have a greater and more powerful impact on humanity than the Lord Jesus Christ. And if it kept the anointing from flowing and the power of God from flowing through him, then it's going to affect anybody and everybody that tries to minister on behalf of God now exactly the same way. And we can see in the Bible that it did. It kept the power of God from flowing through him into them because they got hung up on all of the natural things and aspects of, of that person's life. In their case, Jesus of Nazareth. Not only the prophet, the Messiah, the Son of God. And he could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Unbelief in what? Not in what he said. Unbelief in him. All right, let's go look at it again. A prophet is only without honor. Where? Number one, in his own country. Number two, amongst his own relatives. Say it. <laughs> amongst his own relatives. And then number three, in his own house. His own household. His own home. That's where, that's where he's, there's not, not going to be honor there. And look at verse five. And he, come on, we, we're going to do responsive reading right now. Let's read the whole verse together. I'll say and, and then you kick right in. Ready? And he could there do no mighty work, save he laid his hands on a few sick folk and healed them. And, and the, the, uh, uh, the Greek says, a few individuals with minor ailments. With minor ailments. That means no lame, no blind, no deaf, no mute, no paralyzed, a few sickly folk. Some of your, margin, some of your translations say sickly. Uh, <clears throat> and the Greek English text says uh, a few people with minor ailments. Now, notice the very first uh, uh, words of this particular uh, verse. Does it say he would not or does it say he could not? He could not. That's what it says. He could not. He could not. Their focus on all of the natural aspect of his life is what short-circuited the power of God in flowing into them. See, they weren't hurting him. People, people I, I don't know why. I, I got an, a, a couple apologetic emails uh, 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 about teaching this series. I know when you're teaching about yourself, it must be so difficult. I, I'm not teaching this for me. This isn't about teaching this about myself, teaching the preacher connection. It doesn't hurt me one, not even one iota, not even one little bit. It doesn't hurt me at all. If any one single individual or a whole church full of people or everyone streaming and watching, if they connect to the anointing and the power of God and the call of God upon my life as pastor at Living Word Christian Church, they will or you will be the ones that benefit from that. And if they don't or if you don't, then you'll be the only one that suffers because of it. It's not about me. It doesn't impact me at all. It doesn't affect me at all. It has all the world's difference on how it affects you. See, it didn't affect Jesus. It, it, it didn't affect his, his, the, the anointing on him. It just didn't flow out. Not much different from faith, is it? Because if you go to the previous chapter, you've got the woman with the issue of blood and Jesus walking through the crowd. And it didn't matter that no one else in the crowd accepted or received. It didn't matter that no one else in the crowd reached out and touched the hem of it. He was brushing against people and moving through people and bumping, in, bumping up against people. And when he stopped and he said, who just touched me? They, they looked at him and said, what, what are you talking about? Who touched you? You're walking through a crowd of people. All kind of people are touching you. They all got their hands on you. They're all bumping elbows. They're all no social distancing that day. But he knew that there was one person who had touched him differently than everyone else. See, everyone else having no expectation and not knowing how to connect and not knowing how to pull it out and draw it out and not knowing how to receive, that didn't have any impact on him. The power was still there. 
And when the one person who did know how to connect to the preacher and who did know how to accept and receive and how to get that anointing functioning and operative and, and activated and, and knew how to draw it out, when, when she touched him, he, he, he perceived what? Tell me what he perceived. Power going out of him. Power going out of him for one person. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Now, I found out I can be that one person. I can sit, I can sit in a conference. I can sit in a, in a camp meeting. Uh, I, I can sit in, a, in, in, in any of my pastor's conferences or, or preacher's service. I can sit there, and I can have people all around me sitting here just like this. And they're talking to the people next to them, and they're fidgeting on their paper, and they're working on their cell phone and stuff. I know what they're receiving. Nothing. They're attending a service. That's all they're doing. That's all they're doing. They're just attending a service. And they'll go up in the healing line and stand there like this and shake a little bit, and they'll never receive anything and can't figure out why. Can't figure out why. There are some, there are some absolute golden key secrets in the Bible. Faith is one of them. Honor is a huge one. He says every time he says it, he says only without honor. Honor opens the doors and, 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 and faith, and, and faith opens the doors, and, 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 and desire and, and, and the right motives, and, and there's all sorts of secrets to, to receiving. Uh, and you don't, have to have, you don't have to do anything to not receive. No, you, you don't have to do anything. Not a thing. A prophet's only without honor. Now, now let's go up to verse 3, and let's see what he was talking about that was so dishonorable. What was he talking about here that caused... What, what was happening that caused him to say in verse 4, a prophet is only dishonored in his own country, in his own family and relatives, and his own household, his own, his own home? Uh, what did they say? Verse 3, is not this the carpenter? Stop. What was that a reference to? His job. His job. What he was skilled at, what he did with his time, what he did for a living, what his employment was. What's the second thing they said? The son of Mary. That's that, 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 is that family? Sure. All right. Brother of, so now we're to his, his mother and his brothers, brothers James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon, and, and are not his sisters with us. So they, they talked about his employment, his job, and, and what he was skilled at, what he was talented at, who his mama was, who his four brothers were, and his sisters, and they're with us right now. Uh, let, let, let's, let, let's just reference, I'm not going to turn there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says that there is natural and there is spiritual. Are you familiar with your Bible enough? We don't have to turn there. Yeah, there is a natural and there is a spiritual. The things that they were focusing on right there, were they spiritual or were they natural? Yeah. Tells me right away, right in my Bible, how to keep myself from connecting to the preacher in such a way that I can draw the anointing. All I have to do is say, well, that's Tim Trailer. Uh, he's just up. That's just Timmy. Uh, I've known Tim. I used to be Timmy, Sunday school teacher, you know. Oh, yeah, we used to live next to Tim. I know what kind of lawnmower he uses. I know what kind of snow shovel he uses. Had a snowblower, but the dope broke it, ran it into a, in, in, into a fire hydrant and snapped it. And, and so now he's got to use a snow shovel. <laughs> and and they, just, they just totally short circuit all the power of God. They'll never receive anything ever that that, that, that person has to say. I saw on Facebook that he was out horseback riding and he got dumped off. It was so funny. We had video of it and they, 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 they don't realize they're robbing their life. They'll never receive what God is putting through that particular vessel. Oh, Minister Knack is going to... Let me tell you about Minister Knack. Let me tell you about his wife. Let me tell you about his son, Jason. And you know what Jason, you know where Jason lives? And let me tell you about his daughter. Let me tell you about their grandkids. Oh, what I got to say about their grandkids. They, they, they don't have any idea what they're doing to themselves. They're robbing themselves. There's going to be some level of offense in their life, and they're not going to be in position to activate the and draw out and accept and receive from the anointing that comes through that vessel. 
I've told you some stories here before about people like, like uh, uh, Pastor Bobby Andian tells a story. He pastored for years at Grace Fellowship in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I know him. I was ordained with him uh, for, for some time uh, before Dr. Barkley ordained me. Uh, and, and Pastor Andian is one of the, if not the best Bible teachers in the whole world. And he, he talked about uh, Dr. Hagen because he was right there in Tulsa. And people from his church coming to his office for a counseling appointment saying, I just don't think I ever can receive from Dr. Hagen again, ever. And, and, and the one person said, because I saw that he was eating uh, well, Rocky Rhodes ice cream. I, I was standing, and I looked, at, and it was Brother Hagen. And, and, you know, they expect there to be, like, wings on Brother Hagen and a halo around Brother Hagen and the anointing and the people coming up to make the ice cream cone falling out under the power from Brother Hagen. That's, that's just not going to happen because there's no faith whatsoever and there's no expectation whatsoever and there's no draw whatsoever and there's no honor whatsoever. They're making him an ice cream cone. And they knew what kind it was. And the one person, and, and I don't think I can say the name because it's a national chain of stores, and I might get in trouble because we're broadcasting, but, but they were in a national chain of department stores, and they saw Brother Hagen buying underwear. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's what they said. Yep, Brother Hagen. Yeah, I saw Brother Hagen buying underwear. I just don't think I can ever look at him the same while he's up there preaching again. I just don't think it... And, of course, he's preaching to preachers when he's talking about it. So he says, I don't know if they were shocked that Brother Hagen wore underwear or, or, or that he had to actually buy them, that the angels didn't come and, and carry him in and, 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 and bring him to him. I don't know. He talked about the people that could not come to his, his church, Grace Fellowship. 4,400 people attend the church. And, and family come up and said, uh, we'd really love to be a part of your church, but, but we can't. He said, well... I'm sure you want to tell me why or you wouldn't be up here. Well, we found out that that red T-top Trans Am out there in the parking lot is yours. We could never go to a church where the pastor drove a car like that. Really? All right. Go ahead and go somewhere that's subpar and don't sit under the greatest Bible teacher in the world because of the car he drives. Seriously? Okay, I guess. I guess. There's a couple of Bible words that come to mind. One is depth and one is shallow. And one seems to me to fit that person. Dr. Godot, one of my fathers in the faith, had the exact same thing happen. Had somebody come and say, you, you can't drive. You can't drive that kind of car and be my pastor. Well, he thought, wow, they want me to drive like a Lexus or a Mercedes or something. What kind of car do you want me to drive? And Because he was driving a Lincoln Continental. I mean, not a, just a, 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 even a top line, you know, fancy, just a Lincoln Continental. And he said, well... Uh, a pastor should drive either a good Ford or a good Chevy, but not a Lincoln. Wonder what they'd do if you showed up in a Hyundai. I, I, I'm okay. I, I know a pastor who dri who rides a motorcycle, and had people leave the church when they saw the pastor show up in a motorcycle. See, all of this. All of it is, is totally focused on the wrong thing. I don't care. I'm just talking about me. I don't care that, that my pastor wears, doesn't wear flowers. He, doesn't, he, doesn't, he gets up in his face and stuff, and he just doesn't like flowers. We tried to give him a flower this week. I don't care. I don't even, even give one second worth of thought whether or not he wears flowers or what kind of car he drives or whether he has a truck or a motorcycle or what suit he has on or what tie he has on or whether his socks match or how fast he drives. Pastor Yandian had somebody, had somebody uh, quit his church and leave his church, send him a note because he passed them on the way to church. And they said, and we were doing the speed limit. So my donkey's faster than yours. <laughs> 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 so
See, this has nothing to do with your eternal well-being. This has nothing to do with who you are in Christ. This has nothing to do with what pleases God and what displeases Him. This has nothing to do with His expectations and His requirements. What doth the Lord require of you? It has nothing to do with you walking in the will of God and letting Him order your steps and being led by the Holy Spirit and having the gifts and fruits of the Spirit both growing and manifesting in your life. It has nothing to do with you staying on the straight and narrow path and going through the narrow gate that leads to life and being one of the few there be that find it. it has nothing to do with your prayer life. It has nothing to do with you sharing your faith and witnessing to others. It has nothing to do with spiritual warfare and you resisting demons and devil forces in your life. It has nothing to do with you exercising faith and having heaven's provision for every need you have in every circumstance and every situation. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with their car and and, and, and what kind of ice cream they eat and, and how fast they drive and that they wear underwear. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't his mom Mary? Isn't his brothers James, Joseph, Jude? Wow, we know a lot. We know his whole family. We know his whole family. We can name his brothers by name. We know there's five boys in the family and his sisters. We know mama's name. We know him so well. And people so miss the fact when they say, I just want to be friends with pastor. I just want to do personal things with him. I just want to spend time with him like some of those other people get to. You're in a lot better position if you don't. A lot better. And, 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 and people, they don't, they don't get it. They, they miss it. They miss it. Now, the preacher connection. Uh, I, I'd like my whiteboard in the next four seconds. Because I want to write, like right now, three Two, all right, let's go back, let's go, all right, turn back to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, are you there? Say I'm there if you're there. Say I'm getting close if you're getting close. All right, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And all over the house, I'm hearing it. I'm there. I got it. Got it. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 23. First Thessalonians five, verse 23. This series is called the preacher connection. The preacher connection. All right. So I want to connect. Is there one one end or two? Good. All right, I, I want to connect, but here's the question for tonight. On what level? What level do I want to connect with the preacher on? This verse says, and I pray God that your whole spirit and soul and body be pres So that tells us right now we're three-part being. Spirit, soul, body. Let's take a minute with this. Spirit, soul, and body. I can connect with God on all three levels. 1 Corinthians 14 says I can pray with my spirit and I can pray with my understanding. Now, when I pray, I have to use part of my physical being with my voice box, my tongue, the air coming out of my lungs, forced out by my diaphragm. I'm using my lungs, I'm using my diaphragm, I'm using my throat, I'm using my throat muscles, I'm using my voice box, uh, I'm using my tongue, and I'm using my mouth. And so my the physical, and, and if I'm lifting something, what am I lifting? My hands. I'm lifting my hands. And so there's a physical aspect uh, many times incorporated with prayer. Uh, if I'm praying with my understanding, it means I'm utilizing my... Go ahead, say it. Say it. Brain. brain. All right. So, uh, so I'm utilizing my brain. And, and if I'm, I'm praying with other tongues, 1 Corinthians 14 tells me, my spirit prayeth. 
but my understanding is unfruitful. So I'm incorporating all three levels of my existence, both spirit and soul and body, at times when I pray. When I pray, when I connect with my preacher, with my father in the faith, with my leader, with, with a, a, a minister or a man of God, uh, how am I connecting and on what level? How am I connecting and on what level? All right. Spirit, uh, that would to me be on an eternal level. On a spiritual level. Soul would be either on a mental or an emotional level. Now, I can want to connect with the preacher on an emotional level and totally miss the spiritual level. Totally miss the spiritual level. I want emotional. I want understanding. I want somebody to listen. I, 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 I want to be able to express myself. I, 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 want, I, want, I want to know that somebody feels for me. That's okay if that's what I want. Uh, my question is, what level do you want to connect on? They connected with Jesus on a totally natural level. Totally. Completely. Jesus asked a question in Matthew of his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they gave him a whole long list. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're... And then he just cut to the chase and said, but what about you? But what about you? Who do you say I am? Well, you're the carpenter. That's who he was to some people. To some people, he, 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 was, he was Mary's son. To some people, he was Joseph's brother. To some people, uh, he grew up here. We know his whole family. But he said, what about you? What about you? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say? Who do you connect with me concerning? And, they, and, and Peter stood up and said, you're the son of God. That's what he said. That's, that's exactly what he said. You're the Christ. You're the Christ, son of the living God. Remember what Jesus answered him? All right, let's go back and look at it. Keep your place there. Keep your place. And turn back to the book of Matthew. Ready? Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 13. And Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, uh, uh, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the sent one, the one we've been waiting for, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said, what did Jesus answer and say? You're blessed. He didn't say you're cursed. He said, you're blessed, Simon. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, I'll submit to you tonight, like so many other things, spiritually in our lives, you cannot decide this for yourself. God has to help you. You can't just turn the switch on and say, okay, well, I'm going to determine right now that I'm going to recognize the call, recognize that he's chosen, recognize the anointing. I'm going to just not look anymore at the outward appearance. Remember that verse? Where is it? 2 Corinthians 5, 16. We know no one after the flesh any longer. Although we're around him in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 5, 16, though we're around him in the flesh, though we're, they'll get it up there in just a moment. There it is. Henceforth, no, we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth, no, we him that way no more. See, it's a sad thing, but you hear it all the time. You just hear it all the time. A minister steps off into glory. 
a, a minister, a prophet, a man of God, a John Osteen uh, in our day, uh, an Oral Roberts, a Smith Wigglesworth, uh, and, and after they're gone, people will always say, boy, when he was with us, didn't our hearts burn? See, that's what they said about Jesus in Luke 24. And they walked with him. They got to walk with Jesus, but they didn't recognize who they were with. They didn't recognize what they had. They didn't re recognize the potential. They didn't recognize who it was. And they said, wow. Only after he was gone then did they realize. I mean, could you just think about just having lunch with somebody and talking about the weather and talking about sports and talking about your job and you're just talking about uh, and, and And then at the end of lunch, you know, uh, you, you, they just say, why don't you get the check? I've got somewhere else to go. And they just disappeared. And you realize you just had lunch with Christ. What would you have gone back? See, you can't do that, though. We can't do that. Oh, I wish I would have asked him. Oh, I could. That's what they did. They walked along and they listened and they didn't realize who they were with. Till it was too late, till he was gone. Till he was gone. See? Some people, uh, they want to connect here. They want to connect on the eternal level. They read Ephesians chapter 4, verses 12, 13, 14, and 15, and say, that's for me. That, that, that is for me. They, they read Matthew 9, 36, and say, that's for me. That's for me. Some people want a, want a, want a soulish relationship. They want an emotional, and they want a, they, some, people, some people want a body relationship. What does that mean? Well, the, the, your physical presence. Your physical presence. Your physical presence. Every pastor gets invited to dinner. There's nothing wrong with inviting pastors to dinner. I don't want, you know, for, to not get an invitation to dinner for the next 15 years. Okay, that's not... But, but, but some people, they just feel shorted in all of life if pastor doesn't come to their house for dinner. Not me, not, not this pastor, but I, I'm talking lots of the churches that I grew up in, churches that, that we've attended, churches that, that we associate with. And, and uh, you know, some people, I mean, they invite you to dinner. You hope they invite you the next week. And the week after that, and the week after that, and the week after that, and tell them, don't, just lose the rest of your book. Just keep making that every time I come over. And then some people, when they invite you over, you hope they never invite you again. I'm just, oh, I could tell you some stories, but I'm not going to, but I'm not going to. Not here, but we've had a couple of invites when we were visiting other churches, and Lord have mercy. All right, praise God. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. I attended a minister's meeting uh, and, and uh, was in Texas. Uh, and uh, the young man, I don't know why, I, I just got to sit right next to him. And uh, he elbowed me, never met the man before. And he said, you know who I played golf with today? I mean, he never met the man, don't even know his name. You know who I played golf with today? Uh... Wait, wait, let me see if the Lord will tell me. No, of course I don't know who you played golf with today. I got the to golf today with Oral Roberts and Larry Lee. I said, did you learn anything? And he started telling me about, well, I learned that my... And he started talking about golf. Sit in a golf cart with Oral Roberts and Larry Lee and talk about golf. I got to golf with Dr. Hicks once. I couldn't tell you what the score was. I couldn't tell you anything about the game. You know how well I did? You kidding me? I didn't golf. I'm driving Dr. Roy Hicks around in a golf cart, and I'm going to golf. I'm not going to waste my time golfing. I can golf anytime. Amen. I can golf anytime. I carried the man's clubs. I, carried what, I pulled whatever club out. I talked to him about heaven. I talked to him about hell. I talked to him about marriage. I talked to him about pastoring. I talked to him about church. I talked to him about ministry. I talked to him about helping people. I played golf. And it can be anything. I've got nothing against golf. I've got nothing against fishing. I like to fish. And there are some people, that's all they want in a pastor is somebody to go fishing with. 
how, how horribly, horribly poor a person like that is spiritually. Because they never, ever, ever really grasp that God gave a gift, and it's not to take me fishing or take me golfing or, 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 or going for walks or hikes or, or, or anything of that nature. That's all down here. That's all the physical. And, and, and hey, I, I, I like to fish. I enjoy fishing. I enjoy it. Quite a bit. All right, uh, let's, uh, let, let's, 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 let's go over to John chapter 21. Maybe I should have left that up there. Connect on what level? Uh, look, John chapter 21. You're going to beat me to this one. John chapter 21. Remember what happens? Well, there's several things that happen in here. But remember the conversation that Jesus has with John or with uh, uh, with Peter here in, in, in John 21. Remember this? I didn't hear anybody say I found it. So I found it. <clears throat> All right, John 21, and, and first they have the, uh, they were out fishing, and Jesus wasn't with them, uh, and, and he tells them to uh, throw, their, throw their net on the other side, because uh, they, they had fished all night long and not caught anything. <coughs> hmm. Uh, sounds familiar? <coughs> Cast the net on the right side of the ship, uh, and, and of course they, they, they couldn't even haul it in, it was so full. And after they had dined, look at verse 15. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said, yea, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. He said a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. This is the word pastor. It's, it's the word poimain, pastor my sheep. Peter, tradition tells us, became the first pastor there uh, in, in the church at Jerusalem. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, <clears throat> do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said a third time, do you love me? And said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said a third time, feed my sheep. Now, this is at surface. This is almost a, a confusing, if not concerning, exchange. A lot of people have tried to preach really good sermons from this portion of Scripture. And they say that, well, Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times. And so Jesus gave him an opportunity to confess his love these three times. That kind of sounds okay until you actually study your Bible instead of just reading it. And when you study your Bible... And you realize that there are... Now, we just got done with 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and it said, how many levels can we relate to our God on? Three. Three, Three different levels. Spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. And when you look at this word love in the Bible, you have primarily... I know there's four or five... Uh, uh, but primarily, you have three different Greek words that are translated love. Agape, phileo, and eros, or eros. And isn't that interesting that those three levels or dimensions or kinds of love, they also are spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. 
Agape is the love of God. The love of God. It's an eternal love. It's a love without condition. Unconditional love, we call it. We have all of the characteristics of this love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love takes no account of evil done to it. Love believes the best of every person. Love never fails. Now, these two kind of love, they fail, but the love of God never fails. And that love, Romans 5, 5 says, has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. Phileo. What is phileo? Friendship. It's a friendship. Love. It's emotional. Now, this love can fail. This love does keep score. This love does take account. This love is impatient. This isn't always kind. This is friendship love. It's an emotional love. It's not spiritual. It's not eternal. And that's where we get the word phileo comes, is the root word for Philadelphia, which is known as the city of brotherly love. This is friendship or brotherly love. Okay? Uh, And then eros is where you get the word erotic from, uh, and it's a physical love. Not primarily, exclusively. (laughs) It's physical. It's body. All right? Now, you can love a person, you can love a person on all three levels. You can can love a person. uh, And and, uh, I'll take Paula as an example because she's my wedded wife. Uh, And and I can, without, without any... Uh, any uh, repercussion uh, from heaven without any uh, disappointment or disapproval with God, I can love Paula on all three levels. Spiritually, eternally, with the love of God. Emotionally, as friends, phileo, Philadelphia, uh, and, then, and then even physical love. Okay, that, that, that's, that's reserved for that marriage covenant. And only for that marriage covenant between a man and a woman. Amen. All right. Now, what's so interesting in this portion of Scripture is that Jesus does not use the same word each time, even though in the King James Bible, when we read John chapter 21 and verse 15, it says, Simon, do you love me? And he says, you know I love you. Verse 16, do you love me? You know I love you. Verse 17, do you love me? And you know all things. And he was grieved. Why would he be grieved? Because the first two times Jesus asked him, he said, do you agape me? In verse 15, it says, do you agape me? Do you love me with the love of God? Do you love me with the highest level of love? Do you love me with the highest form of love? Do you love me with an unconditional love? And Peter said, you know that I phileo you. Peter knew he was surrounded by those other disciples and he was sitting talking to the Son of God himself and he could snow everybody else, but he couldn't snow him. And when Jesus said, do you agape me? Peter said, you know I phileo you. Verse 16, he repeats it. And he says, Peter, son of Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? And Peter said, you know, Lord, that I phileo you. And he said, Pastor, my sheep. And verse 17, finally he says to Peter the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I phileo you. See, this wasn't about making up for his denial. Jesus was helping him locate himself. And he was doing it publicly right in front of these other people. And the Lord Jesus Christ is a master at that. He'll help me see where I'm lacking. He'll help me see what he wants for me. He'll help me see that I still have growing and maturing to do. He'll help me see that I need to step up 
He'll point things out in my life like unforgiveness, like time wasting, like slothfulness, like unforgiveness. He'll point things out in my life that I need to address. And sometimes he'll just do it publicly. Now, no, maybe nobody else there knew what was happening, but everyone else there heard what was being said. And everyone else there, my guess is we're sitting back thinking, oh, I hope you don't call on me next. Oh, I hope you don't ask for a raise of hands. Oh, I hope it's just Peter that gets called on the carpet tonight. Peter was the only one. I said this right at the get go, right out of the gate. I said it. Peter was the only one who was going to be anointed to pastor that church in Jerusalem. And that means given the responsibility of that. And that's the only reason the anointing would come to do it. And he was the one that Jesus was addressing and saying to him, this isn't good enough. And you need to step it up. You need to grow it up. You need to increase. You can't afford to stay where you're at. He said to him, do you agape me? And he said, you know I phileo you. I'm not quite there. I'm at that friendship place. I'm at that place that's not perfect love. I'm at that place that can fail. I'm at that place who still is a little bit selfish and not always kind. And he asked him three times, and finally the third time, he came down to his level and said, do you phileo me? And all Peter had to say was yes, but instead it grieved his heart because he knew Jesus was identifying right where he was at. See? Everybody doesn't love Jesus with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, but he wants them to. Everybody isn't connected with him to the level that he would like them to be. Everyone isn't. Okay? Now, let's go back and, and, and look uh, as we start to close once again at, at Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I got it. All right, Mark chapter 6. And again, let's look at verse 3. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son? Aren't his brothers James, Joseph, Judah, and Simon? They didn't say, aren't his brothers James and Judas? And what are those other two guys? What are their names? They didn't say that. They knew his family by name. They knew every one of them. They knew how many there were. They knew mama's name. They, they, they knew everything about him. Naturally. And because of that, he could do no mighty work there. Uh, it, it says over in Matthew 13, and they were offended at him. And they were, here it says he marveled in verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief. Now I'm going to make this statement. You go ahead and write it down uh, if you want. Uh, it, it says here, connect with the preacher uh, on what level? Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and make the statement. Uh, the closer you are naturally, the harder it is for you spiritually. The closer you are, you, 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 the closer you are. See, I, I think I told you, I, I'm, not, I'm not positive I, I told you the story. Did I tell you about Dr. Barclay and, and Lester Summerall inviting him up to his room? Did I tell you that story? Shake your head no or yes, one or the other. Don't, don't answer because I can't read your mouth. No, no. Uh, my pastor, Dr. Mark Barclay, who was just here on Sunday, uh, after a meeting, Dr. Summerall came to him. Anybody know who Dr. Lester Summerall is? I mean, Dr. Summerall is one of the most powerful, powerful men of God to live during our lifetime and knew more about the spirit realm, knew more about dealing with demons and devils and evil spirits and spiritual warfare than any human that's, that's lived in our times. And, and he's the one who made the statement that every thought you ever have come from one of two places. And you'll have to discern as a Christian with and you ought to, you ought to pray all the time that God would help you. That every thought that flows through you is either a demon uh, or, or, or an evil spirit or the Holy Spirit. And you don't have any original thoughts. Now, now, Dr. Summerall, he just got done doing a, doing a service. And, and Dr. Barclay, he said, I'm just brand new in, in ministry. Uh, he's not even, not even hardly started a church. Uh, and, and he said, I, I didn't even know Dr. Summerall knew who I was. And, and, and Dr. Summerall came out. And there was an entryway full of people. And he heard, he heard, Mark, he talked like that. He was always gruff like that. Mark. And, and he said, well, I knew that was my name, but there's no way Dr. Summerall could be talking to me. He didn't even know I exist. And he said, Mark. 
And he finally said, I, I thought I would turn. And, and, and I looked at Dr. Summerall, he's a few feet away, and I said, M me? He said, is your name Mark? I said, yes. He said, then I mean you. I said, yeah, yes, Dr. Summerall. He thought he had a demon on him or something. He said, yeah, yes, Dr. Summerall. And he said, come to my room and eat fruit. <laughs> Doc Dr. Barclay said, the first thing I thought was, I don't even like fruit. <laughs> but Dr. Summerall doesn't invite you to, your, to his room after the service to eat fruit, and you tell him, I don't eat fruit. You don't eat, no, you just go. And so he went. And they got in the elevator, nothing was said. They got to the room, and there was a big fruit plate there. And, and he, Dr. Summerall pulled him up a chair, and he pulled up a chair and said, Eat. Dr. Summerall don't say eat. I mean, he like picked up a grape. Like, this is where I learned to pay attention. My pastor doesn't like fruit. We don't put fruit over there for him. We put nuts. He don't eat fruit. Any kind of fruit, especially kiwis. <laughs> and Dr. Summerall looked at him and said, Would you like to be my friend? That's it. That's the whole conversation. No small talk. No testimonies, no stories. He ate a couple of pieces of fruit, and he said, would you like to be my friend? And Dr. Barclay said, no. No. No, I don't want to be your friend. Please forgive me if I'm getting the answer wrong. I don't think I've ever been addressed with this question, but no, I don't want to be your friend. I want to be your son. I want to be somebody that's ministered to by you and impacted by you. I don't want to be close to you, get familiar with you, play with you, chum with you, and pal with you, and hang out with you. I don't want to do that. I want to follow you. I want to serve you. I want to wait on you. I want to learn from you. I want you to mentor me. I want you to be a father to me. I don't want to be your friend. Dr. Summerall said, then you can be my son because everybody else wants to be my friend. And you're the first person I found that doesn't want to be. You can be my son. And he became a father to him. And he was a father to him till the day he went to heaven. Over 30 years later. Some people don't get the preacher connection. Some people want to be connected on some of the lower levels. And they hurt themselves. They don't hurt the preacher. They don't hurt the preacher at all. The preacher will hurt them if he lets that continue. And then they don't get that. Then they think he's mean, he doesn't like him, and, and, and he's unapproachable, and, and all kinds of things. And that hurts our life. I hope, I hope, I hope this is okay for a, for a midweek service. The closer you are, the harder it is. Now think how hard this is for my wife. Think how hard it is for the woman that sits right here in the front row every service. Think how hard it is to accept and receive the person whose socks you wash and, and, and the person you help bandage up their belly because they cut themselves this, this afternoon and it's bleeding and how could you be dumb and do something like that? And, 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 and how, how do you, 
How, how do you switch hats from lover to friend to pastor and still receive and still accept? How do you stand in a healing line? How do you stand in a line and have the holy hands of the messenger of heaven placed on you and accept and receive that anointing when, when, when you do that person's laundry? You watch them when they have the flu. When they lose their temper because somebody cuts them off in traffic. You know they drive too fast. How do my parents, how do my parents get over the fact that she birthed me and he carried me? How, how do they get past that? How difficult is that? How challenging is that? See, that's that, 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 that my own house. How about my kids? What kind of challenge do my children, my son and my daughter, and now, now the two that are married into my family, how, how do they get over that? How do they get past that? They come over for holidays. My mom, my mom opens Christmas presents slower. Don't tell me you open them slow because you've never been to my house. <laughs> I mean, she don't even like to tear it. She tries to get the tape just as it, and just, and she takes a paper off and she folds it up all so nice and stuff. Me, she knows how I open presents. <laughs> you might as well not even wrap them. God made gift bags. Turn it up, dump it upside down, see what's in it. We're done. Wrap it up so nice just to rip it open. Throw the bows and our favorite parts, bundling it up and shooting baskets to the trash over across the room. And, 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 and you know, we, we eat till we can't eat anymore and fall asleep watching the football game. And, and then you come to church and, and have to accept and receive. And all you can think about is how many cheese curds did that boy eat? But I knew him when he was 14. I knew him when he was 11. Let me tell you about the time my son threw a rock through the window across the street when they were. They have to get over all that. Or they never receive anything. They'll get stuck in that natural realm, and they'll never, ever, ever, ever be able to get over into you're the Christ, son of the living God. God himself showed you that, or you don't get shown. How about my aunts and uncles? Oh, some of them still call me Marky. <laughs> and, 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 and when we have conversation... How about my sister and my brother? How about my cousins? Yeah, they come and they want to talk about eternal things. And you know what my submission of the eternal things is? It's just one more opinion at the table. That's all it is. And it's nothing more to them. Nothing. Because they're from my house. And they're my relatives. And I'm in my own country. And it's difficult for people to get through the natural barrier to see that this is a gift from heaven. And if I can't separate what my pastor drives, wears, eats or doesn't eat, the, the things he does, or even some of the things he says, or habits that he may have, I'll never, ever, ever be able to home in on the gift that God gave and receive from that gift. If I get caught up in all the natural stuff, at any level, at any, at any time, it short circuits the power of God. I have to look past everything natural, including the encasement. Do you think pastor's hair is thinning? What, you blind, don't you? <laughs> no, no. 
What does it matter? What does that matter? Didn't he wear that tie two weeks ago? Probably. I do wear them more than once. I've learned a couple secrets. And one of them is I have to purpose. We've come full circle because you were exhorted right when we started. Right when we very, the very first start, there was one of our staff ministers standing up here saying, you have to purpose to receive. You have to purpose to receive. And, and I've finished my assignment for tonight. Uh, but I have to do that. You know, I categorize everything. I'm not talking to you about me. I'm talking about me. Uh, and, and when it comes to... Uh, every time I get in, in, in my pastor's presence, every time, I didn't even think about it till right this instant right now, but I, I gave my pastor a gift right up here in the front on Sunday morning. I never thought about it again. I never, ever even thought about it. I didn't have to switch back into, okay now, all right now, um, this is the gift of God placed on the earth exclusively for me. And, and now i got to cleanse my mind and wash my mind and get all that out. I, 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 I'm going to receive. I, I, I never even thought about it again. Gave him the gift. Wanted to honor him. Gave him the card. Gave him, that was full of honor. It gave him a couple of gifts. Uh, and and, and just, just stay in that place. Stay in that place. Hope this has helped you tonight. I hope, I hope it has. Um, purpose in yourself, not only to receive, and, and the ex exhortation was purpose to connect, but purpose to connect where? Purpose to connect on what level? Because I can be anybody's friend. If you can't be my friend, something's wrong. I mean it. I, I mean, I can be anybody's friend. I can. I, I'm... They can't be mine for some reason, I don't know, but I'll be anybody's friend. I really will. I've learned something about this great God that we serve. You know what I've learned about him? He'll meet you on whatever level you're on. I mean, even if you're flaky. I'm totally serious. Our, our, our God, he'll, 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 he'll meet you right there. If you're all caught up in things and your whole focus in life is, is, is what you can gain and get, he'll meet you there. He really will. He'll just meet you right there. You'll never go on into the more important things. And that's what your Bible says. If you can't get money straight, who is going to give you the real things of real spiritual value? That's what he said. So, but he'll meet you wherever you're at. He was willing to meet Peter. He was actually willing to come down a step and say, do you phileo me? Do you? And... and you know, if a person wants to play tennis, I haven't played tennis in 25, 30 years. I'll play tennis with you. I'll play pool with you if you tell me which end of the queue to hit the ball with. I... But if I had my druthers, my druthers would be let the anointing of the eternal Lord of all who called me to pastor minister to you out of that anointing because I know how much that'll help you. I know how much my pastor uh, helps me. Not so much what he says, not so much what he teaches, but the pastoral anointing on his life to lead me. That impacts me. Paul and I were talking about what a, what, a, what a tremendous, tremendous, awesome, unexplainable, immeasurable, eternal difference it's made in our lives. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let's all stand. Thank you for watching The Word of the Lord, a weekly television broadcast of Living Word Christian Church. Living Word Christian Church welcomes you to join us at 2015 Ward Avenue in La Crosse, Wisconsin, Sunday mornings at 8.15 and 10.30, and Wednesday evenings at 7. 
For more information on Living Word Christian Church, visit us on the web at lwcclax.com.